I'm Beth Hyland, and I'm with Heath Rutledge. We're at the Corning Museum of Glass on uh, Thursday, July 5th, 2012, and welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, you were telling me, or could you tell me where and when you were born? I was born right here in Corning in 1935, back in the times were tough. Yeah. And uh, two years later, my father died and uh, uh, at a very young age and uh, because of work he was doing at Corning, uh, very long hours and heavy work uh, lugging glass around. They didn't have all the fancy equipment we have today. And he had a stroke. And uh, uh, anyway, that pushed me to live with my grandparents and my uncles then became my fathers, or substitute fathers. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly learned that when you do things uh, correctly, you get support one way or another. As a kid, it was some candy or something. Uh, and if you didn't do things well, uh, people kind of turned away and moved away. Uh, so it t taught me as a child that what I wanted to do was to make a difference in the world so that people were benefited, including me. That's right. <laughs> um, so you've lived in Corning, other places too? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, where I live with my grandparents on the farm, uh, the farm was nice, they had food. <laughs> uh, it was up near Ithaca. Oh, nice. And, uh, but after I got old enough to go to school, uh, my mother did not want me to go to a one-room schoolhouse, and that's all they had. Uh, so she brought me back home, and by this time she's remarried. And my new father, uh, I went along, came along as a, a not necessarily his preferred uh, addition. And as a very young child, he told me that uh, uh, as soon as I got to be 12 years old, I was to be able to make enough money to buy everything except the food and shelter that I w he would provide. Wow. So uh, I became essentially a a young businessman. What kinds of things were you doing? Uh, I uh, worked in restaurants, cleaned floors, cleaned windows, uh, burned papers, uh, shoveled snow, anything that you could do to earn uh, a few pennies. That's a lot of responsibility for a young kid. Uh, I, I had to buy my clothes, so uh, that was it. You better make sure you have enough money for the clothes. And where did you go to school? I went to school in Oswego. Well, the, uh, in high school, it was right here in Corning. And uh, uh, I had planned on being a carpenter with Corning. Because in those days, uh, Corning had its own uh, apprenticeship program and taught people how to do whatever, as long as they passed the test. And I knew I could pass the test. Uh, but my teacher said it was a waste of my life. And they put together on their meager income, I didn't know at the time how meager it was, but uh, on their meager income, they put together enough money to send me for one year of college without any payment on my part. Or excuse me, not one year, one semester. So at least I would know what college was. That's incredible. And uh, once I got in college, why well, it didn't take much, and I, uh, I was in, in love with college. Who were your teachers? Uh, in, in college? I'm thinking of your, your scholarship. The scholarship teachers? Then you can move on to college. Uh, my lead teacher was Borum. Uh, she's long gone now, uh, obviously, because I graduated in 1954 from high school. And, uh, uh, and I have no idea what teachers contributed. All I know was that when the scholarship was read, it was read uh, as though your teachers want you to at least know what college is. 
here is your scholarship money to send you for your first semester. That's incredible. That's wonderful. I hadn't even made an application. Wow. My, uh, anyway, it, it was a, a great honor. And uh, as it turned out, it really turned my life around. Carpentry would have been fun, but my life has been such an adventure. Well, tell me more about school and how you decided to come back to Corning. Uh, I went to my, my the, the scholarship for, for a teacher's college. And uh, I liked a number of different things, but one of the things that I liked in high school was shop. So I decided I'll be an industrial arts teacher. So once I got on campus, I discovered that I liked a lot of different things. So I had several majors. Uh, in addition to, my, they took all the credits they would allow me to take. As long as you kept your grades up, that was okay. That's fantastic. And uh, uh, so when I graduated, the best offer that I had was from the same principal that had been my guidance counselor in high school. And uh, that was the best offer I had. And when I got here, I discovered that Corning was and having double sessions, a 10 period day. And uh, so during that 10 period, I taught five different subjects, nine classes. Wow. So I had, they have one period that I had free, theoretically. I really, ac actually I had 20 minutes to eat lunch, and the rest of the time I had a study hall. Uh, they treated me not as, not very respectful, I didn't think. Pay was terrible. Uh, my starting pay for a year's work with four-year college, $3,000. It was not enough to raise a, a family, and I had a wife and, and a young son. And uh, so uh, I did maintenance work on people's homes and what have you, and did whatever I could to make the extra money. I knew how to make extra money. Uh, my youth taught me that. And so I worked on from there uh, to, uh, they said they, my, my my doctor said, you're losing too much weight. And I, when I graduated from college, I was already down to 150 pounds, six foot tall, 150 pounds. And by this time, I was down to 145 pounds. Uh, and I said, better write a prescription. I'll take it to the principal. The principal uh, uh, said, we'll do better by you next year. We can't, do any ch it can't change anything this year. So next year, nothing really changed, not substantially. So I made, got my resume put together and sent it out to other school districts and to industry. And uh, Corning Glassworks at the time, uh, they said they would like to hire me. And I had all kinds of interviews. It was, uh, I won't tell you about the process, but uh, I ha they gave me enough money to, to start so that I was able to buy a car with the extra money. And because uh, pr prior to that, the only way I could get to work was walk or take a bus when the buses ran, because they weren't very reliable. Sure. Uh, it, was, it was very nice. But I also had an agreement with the people that hired me. It was the refractory division, which no longer exists in Corning, uh, and R&D, that if they thought I could qualify to become an engineer, that they would give me a raise within the first six months. And if not, they would fire me. My request. And they agreed. And at the end of six months, I not only got a nice raise, uh, they, they also gave me a contract to uh, pay for my engineering schooling as long as they selected the classes. Interesting. And obviously you took them up on it. I took them up on it, yes. Uh, I never, because of all of the different colleges they sent me to, I never got one engineering degree from any one place. 
but I have, uh, according to tests that were given in those days, I have uh, electrical engineering uh, certification, uh, ceramic engineering, safety engineering, and, uh, and I almost qualify for the mechanical engineering. That's great. So you went to Alfred and other places as Alfred, well? Alfred, Syracuse, Cornell, you know, all over the place. And these were over various years? Over, or? over the years, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. great. And uh, also up at Corning Community College, they had many of their own uh, staff that were teaching engineering classes up at the Corning Community College. Oh, interesting. And uh, so I went up there. It was, that was the most convenient. I bet. But uh, it, it allowed me to make some uh, substantial contributions in the refractory area. Ceramics was my primary focus in the, my studies. And uh, uh, we developed some new kinds of refractory that had uh, that lasted longer, would operate at higher temperatures, and had uh, less tendency to develop bubbles in the glass, which is one of the big problems with refractories. Uh, and then I went from refractories to specialty ceramics, and it, there I learned, I took what I had learned about refractories and learned how to make furnaces for special applications. And uh, uh, one of the furnaces was an induction furnace. The induction furnace uh, experience allowed me to do some of the preliminary work on furnaces that are now used for make, making fiber optics. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, and anyway, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, when I left the refractory division, I then went to the lighting division because they needed someone with furnace experience. And they needed someone with, with uh, chemistry. Well, my chemistry wasn't too bad. My, f my son is a chemist and a chemical engineer, so uh, he was going to carry on for dad. Uh, does he work for Corning? No, he does not work for Corning. Corning, he wanted to work for Corning, and the interviewer uh, he, he was not very complimentary of the <laughs> guy that did the interviewing. So he, he went to work for someone else, but uh, he's, he's got a, a very good job today. That's great. But uh, it's been a few years. But you were telling me about your chemistry background and how that but was But the, the, the chemistry background, uh, uh, they needed some of that because they were looking for new ways of making lighting and coatings inside of lighting uh, systems and uh, but their primary as it turned out their primary uh, interest was on how to melt and make glass in special forms and high temperatures and special chemistries hmm. and uh, uh, so uh, I developed something I called a Chinese hat furnace that operated at 1850 degrees centigrade uh, pretty hot yeah. Uh, it was just below the, the border of the refractory that I could get to make the furnace. Uh, and it was uh, enabled me to control the atmosphere in the melt. You couldn't melt a lot of glass, but you could melt. Uh, on one project, uh, a glass that they had made up in, in Sullivan Park and had chart to, had to do only by hand because of the character of the glass. And I said, I've, ta I've seen your, your, the chemistry of this product. Uh, I think my Chinese hat can product uh, can do this. So I melted the glass in my Chinese hat. I made enough glass in 20 minutes to last them for five years. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they were selling at the same price they were doing it by hand up on Sullivan Park. So they made big bucks. Nice. <laughs> it took me a more, more than 20 minutes to actually do the whole thing because uh, I had to put the product, project together and uh, configure the furnace and all the rest of it. And part of making the Chinese hat furnace, it needed special kinds of burners because they didn't have them. 
and they, uh, the gas oxy burners ended up uh, in years later. Uh, they're used in furnaces all around the company now. I didn't bother to patent it because I didn't think it was pertinent. Well, today, it's, Corning has the patent, I think, on the glass oxy burner that the company is using. Uh, was that design, the Chinese hat, used for other applications? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. A number of them. But uh, most of them were fairly, uh, they weren't terribly profitable like the, the other one was. But they did prove that you needed a special atmosphere, and, and I could design the atmosphere to get involved with the chemistry part. Fantastic. Uh, we also did induction heating, and of course induction heating is, uh, is used quite broadly today within the company. Uh, Tell me more what that means so everyone it, would know. Induction heating uh, is essentially you have a coil around the outside of a solid uh, coil, a co core, and when you set up a, cert a certain frequency, the center core becomes like a short, hmm. uh, like be on the secondary of a transformer. And uh, you can push those things. In fact, one time I had my temperature reading readout device failed, and I melted my furnace. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it became something like 2,500 degrees centigrade, which melted the refractory materials. I bet the firemen loved you. <laughs> uh, they didn't know. Okay. They didn't know. Yeah. When you build these things in, in laboratory, you make sure you build in safety. So whenever anything goes wrong like this, in case something goes wrong, this is what's, what's going to happen. It's going to happen automatically. Nice. All that backup. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, we developed a new melting system and a new product, and it was installed in Fallbrook, and they needed some new parts. So what do you suppose one of the engineers did down there? If it gets out about this, they're not going to like me. But they sent the whole set of drawings for that furnace to the company that made the uh, refractory parts. It happened to be the company that was a primary customer for the product. They went into business two years, uh, two years later, by the for themselves. And Corning no longer had uh, their primary customer. They had other customers, but not enough to keep them, uh, keep them operating. Oh, what a shame! But it was a lot of fun putting them together, anyway. I bet. <laughs> and uh, because of uh, a number of these things in the, in the lighting division. Uh, and there were constantly different divisions were asking for new furnace designs. And so the company put together within their, their corporate engineering division uh, a furnace development group. And John Bruns was the, uh, the guy that they selected to put that together. And uh, he hired my boss. Well, my boss uh, got promoted and he said, hire Heath to take my place. Hey. Nice. And uh, one form or another, I was in uh, the furnace development group for the rest of my, life, my career. And you sound like you enjoyed it. Oh, boy, it was. Uh, they actually paid me for the job. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, when I was uh, working in the laboratory, we had uh, models, fluid models, that would electrically conduct uh, and heat up accordingly and prevent and create uh, convection currents, act just exactly like fur the actual furnace would. But you, it was low temperature, so you could see through, and you could, with, by putting tracers in, you could see what was happening. And uh, uh, about this time, Corning is developing Corel dinnerware. But when they started to melt beyond the laboratory, they discovered that uh, it's a fluoride glass, 
one of the major byproducts of burning fuels, fossil fuels, is water. It was combining with the fluoride, and we had hydrofluoric acid going out the stack, and it was killing the trees in the valley. I'm not sure what it was doing to people's lungs, but the company decided that uh, it was a good idea not to do, to do it that way. So the Furnace Development Group got a, a, an assignment to find a different way to melt the glass that would not create this adverse effect. And uh, so we said, well, uh, glass, once it gets to a certain temperature, is electrically conductive. Therefore, uh, we'll build a furnace. So we built a, a little furnace that was about uh, two feet in diameter. And it worked like gangbusters. And uh, uh, using tr standard three-phase power. And so we went from the little one to a bigger one. And it worked like gangbusters. It worked good enough so that it was enough to produce glass for one uh, farming position. Uh, and so we installed it in the Pressware plant. And uh, I designed the delivery system for, for the furnace. And uh, uh, we found all the reasons why my system was not as good as it should be. Oh, really? Uh, so we redesigned it for the next version. But in order to have a, a more financially competitive uh, volume, a minimum of 110 tons per day, uh, we needed a much bigger furnace. And so in the modeling uh, operation, I built a larger model that would simulate, uh, uh, I won't use the numbers, but uh, a much larger furnace. And it didn't work like the smaller ones did. And my boss says, no problem. All we need to do is this. Well, this didn't work. And so he says, I got a backup. Well, backup didn't work either. And he says, I'm going on vacation, and so is everybody else in the department except for you, Heath. The lab's all yours. And uh, so I prayed to my God, uh, God, if my boss and all of those PhDs that are working for him, I'm no PhD, how am I going to solve the problem? I'm just going to fill time, unless you help me. That night I had a dream. And I'm, I'm, I always have a little pad alongside of my bed. So I took notes from the dream. And all it was was some symbols. And so then I had the next day, uh, I didn't have a clue what they were about. Now, I'm working on my electrical engineering credentials, but uh, I hadn't gone very far, quite honestly. And so I did, had to do a lot of learning fast. So I read every textbook I could get my hand on uh, within the company uh, and anyone that knew anyone outside of the company. And within one week, I figured out what the symbols were about. And then I reconfigured the, the physical model and proved that it, uh, I had to design a new circuit that would uh, take standard three phase and convert to six phase or nine phase or 12 phase. And uh, when my boss got back, he was ecstatic. He says, we got to get this patented quick. Uh, we wrote up the patent. It was issued in, in uh, six months. I don't know what you know about patents. That's, way, that's very fast. That's exceptional, yeah. It, were, it was well written, and it didn't trap, step on anybody else's toes. So, uh, uh, so the Corel process uses uh, my patent. Congratulations. <laughs> but, uh, and an awful lot of people have had <laughs> lots of work since. Sure. And I had a big family. Uh, my, in the flood of 72, I lost my wife. So I had four kids I was raising by myself. And uh, in 1975, I needed 
uh, someone to take care of my kids while I went off for a spiritual retreat weekend. And the usual lady that took care of the kids, they didn't like her too well. She was too bossy. She was very good at sitting in chairs and giving orders, from what I was told. I wasn't there. Anyway, uh, so I asked this new lady that I had met in a ecumenical church meeting only a couple of weeks earlier. I found out that she babysat, so I said, would you be interested in taking care of my kids while I'm gone? And she would, and uh, when I came back, my kids had asked her whether she'd be interested in being their mother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're very smart. I'm still married to her. That's wonderful. But she had two girls and wanted brothers. Wow. Or a, at least a brother. And now I had two boys and two girls. So now they got an older brother and a younger brother. And everybody lives in the Corning area still, or you said they're uh, all around? Well, I have uh, a son that is a part of the uh, state police up in, uh, out of uh, Watkins Glen. Uh, my oldest boy is down in Maryland, near Baltimore. Uh, my uh, oldest daughter died of cancer uh, about six years ago. I'm sorry. And my younger daughter works for Corning. At one point, uh, I'm bragging a little, uh, Donna Keegan, uh, she wanted to be a secretary. And I couldn't talk her out of it. She had a full scholarship at a prestigious university, and she turned it down for a two-year degree in a secretarial practice. And she says, I'm going to be a private secretary. I says, Donna, no, you're not. It takes a lot more than two years to be a private secretary. That's a four-year program. She says, you're wrong. I got her an interview, and she didn't want to hear it. Anyway, she finished up, and uh, she worked as a uh, substitute for different places, temp, and then she finally got a job uh, working in, in purchasing, incidentally, where she works now. And uh, she uh, uh, the, the head of the purchasing at the time had just come back from a long business trip. He had all the stuff that needed to be typed up. And so he didn't know Donna from anyone else. And uh, he handed her a pile of stuff to, to type up for him. Uh, and uh, he says, when you're finished, come back. And she came, and she came back and after lunch. And she says, what's next? His eyes opened up. He, he thought he'd given her enough work to keep her busy for at least two days. And uh, she finished up that project, and he literally found work for her to do for the rest of the week, because he thought it would take a full week to get this, his work done. Anyway, uh, she went from there to Pressware. And incidentally, I'm working uh, with the installation team putting in the new Pressware system for Corel. And, uh, uh, the head of the engineering group had written up a spreadsheet. This is back in the old days when computers were really slow. Uh, and at, periodically they would take data and put it into this spreadsheet. And she watched them for a while. And she said, can I have a copy of that program? She's never taken a class in programming. And he wonders what, what she wants it for. Well, she, she says, I think. We, I think it can be much more efficient and uh, maybe give you some more information. Well, he literally laughed at her because I heard her when she asked her, asked him. And, uh, and a few days later, why she stayed after him apparently because I wasn't there all the time. And uh, he uh, did indeed give her a copy, the master copy of the program. And she rewrote it. And then 
she asked him, you, t you give me the data that you put into your program, and I'll put it into this program, and, and then we'll compare outputs. Uh, within a week, they were using her program. <laughs> and she was only a temp, because the regular secretary has, was out um, for, uh, to have a baby. Well, I'm not sure how they managed it, but she was hired full time. And in the year 2000, uh, she had worked her way up through the company and still with only a secretarial degree. That shows the, um, the kind of leadership that Corning had in the, first, in the last century. Uh, she was a director nice. in one of our divisions. But then when the, everything collapsed and the, price, the stock market, uh, <laughs> uh, I think, well, I bought some Corning stock at $2.25. So is she still working for Corning? Or? Yes. That's yes. great. She, she worked for Corning, but she's back in the purchasing department uh, working her way back up again. Because she, after she, uh, after they down, well, actually they got rid of one, one whole division, uh, including her boss. Uh, he, she had a phone call that came in and people were taking her call because she's no longer at her desk any longer. And uh, uh, the guy that called said, uh, uh, can I, will you provide me with Donna's home phone? He called her home, he says, you want a job? <laughs> so she was out of a job for a whole week and had another director's job in another company that not as big as Corning, didn't pay the kind of salaries that Corning would make, but would pay, but uh, she had a nice job. That's good. But she wanted to come back to Corning. And after, I think she worked for that other company about a couple of years, and, and then, uh, uh, then my daughter, oldest daughter got sick with cancer and she literally quit her job so she could spend more time with her sister. That's the caliber. Yeah. I say I'm proud of my kids. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's go back to your furnaces. Okay. Um, it sounds like, did you also travel to some of the other plants? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, one of the other things besides Furnace, electric furnaces, um, I also did oil modeling uh, so that the uh, fusion process that we have, uh, I was part of developing the fusion process in the oil model stages. Tell us what that means so the cam people watching this oh, would know. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the fusion process has glass that's melted and processed, and I'm not going to tell you how it's processed, okay. but then it goes into a ditch that's specially designed so that it has a uniform flow of glass over two edges. It comes down and it's in a V-shape. You can see it in the, uh, there's a version of it in the museum. Okay. And, and, and those two sections come down and they fuse together. And you end up with two surfaces that are virgin. No polishing required. It keeps the price and the quality of the product um, yeah. such as, the, well, it, there wasn't much competition for it for a long time. I, I know that now they have, they have a com competition from someplace, but I don't know how they're doing it in, in maintaining the price. Because that price is, uh, that, the quality. Uh, give you an idea of the quality of a piece of, piece of uh, fusion glass. If you take a uh, usable piece of uh, fusion glass, well, take one that maybe six feet wide. Okay. If you've got one section in that, if you take, uh, imagine that the size of a football field, and you put a dime in the middle of that football field, 
that dime would make that piece of glass rejectable. Wow. Caliber. That's really high standards. That's high standards. Uh, and if you don't have that, uh, if you've ever seen a product where it had that kind of default, boy, does it disturb the, the picture of a uh, flat screen TV or your laptop computer or whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of traveling around uh, Harrodsburg. Uh, needed uh, some furnaces that had electric boosting. And one of the ways of doing that was with tin oxide electrodes. Now tin oxide doesn't conduct electricity uniformly. It has a high, relatively high resistance, but it is better than a brick, obviously. But it has all of the characteristics of a brick. But if you take tin oxide, and you put it into a furnace at specific temperatures uh, and you pump all of the air out and you put just nitrogen in. Nitrogen's non-reactive. It takes a tin oxide of most, uh, a brick of tin oxide which is maybe four by six inches uh, by uh, a foot and a half long. Uh, the resistance is, is almost as good as copper. Wow. You get involved with chemistry again. <laughs> 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 but uh, Harrodsburg uh, had a special furnace down there that uh, we could process all of our tin oxide, and they needed tin oxide electrodes uh, processed as well. So, hey, we had a teamwork there. <laughs> That's great. So. Uh, uh, Whenever you have uh, resources within the company, you don't want others to know what you're doing. Use those resources and use them well. But that's one example of, uh, uh, and of course the, the company sold off the refractory division, but the formulas had already been developed and they were available to anybody at this point. Some of the refractories, I made sure that when we, when we were putting together the uh, details for the Corel process. Have you ever seen the Corel furnace? I have. You have, okay. But everybody else hasn't, so tell that, us more about it. That's, well it's, it's round, it's like a, like a big cup, a very big cup. And uh, with all of the electric power, uh, the transformers are capable of over a thousand volts at about 300 amps. And if you've got anything, including water going through cooling panels, that is conductive, then you've got a big problem. Huh. You're, you're literally sucking power out of your furnace. So you have to have, you had, we had to put together a, uh, a special water system with special cooling systems uh, that would not take power out of the furnace. Uh, and that round furnace, there's lots of cooling panels to keep the outside of the refractory hot because the inside's very hot. And with the, the multiple phases that we have around it now, uh, it has very uniform temperatures. I did some consulting for uh, Westinghouse after I retired. And uh, they were, they had one of our vertical melters with uh, obviously the electrical heating system. They melted special glass and they put atomic waste in it. This is down in Savannah River in South Carolina, okay. if you know where that is. And uh, uh, I got a, a phone call from John Bruns, who was retired now, and he says, uh, maybe you were willing to talk with them. He says, they won't listen to anybody. He says, I, th he says, I think they like problems. Westinghouse is not listening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, th those people are long gone, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but anyway, the... Uh, 
So they called me on the telephone, and I said, well, what about this and this? And get, give me, collect these best pieces of data and, and tell me about it. And they gave me these answers, and they didn't make sense. Something was missing. And I couldn't find out from them, from the guy I was talking to on the phone, what was missing. <clears throat> oh, toward the end of my career, I was getting bored because I wasn't taking any more engineering classes. So I went back to school and studied for the ministry. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I was pastoring the church in my retirement. And I'd, I got permission from my church to take three days, one day to fly out, one day to interview Westinghouse, another day to fly back. And uh, when I got down there and started asking questions, I found out from the guy that I was my contact that he didn't know all the answers. He thought he knew the answers, so I began to ask him about it. And this is a government process. Anytime it has atomic waste, it has, it's a government process. And they were having a problem on this part of the process. Well, I don't know if you know anything about engineering, but every aspect of the project, it, it's like a link of trains, uh, of cars on a train. If one stops, they all stop. If they all go, they all go until you break the link. And most processes, it's very difficult to break a link. So I want, needed to find out what the link was from this problem to the other parts of the process. Well, they said, you can't talk to this man. Well, do you, what's the man's name? Oh, I knew his dad. Uh -huh. <laughs> when we go to lunch, it, do you eat, in the, eat lunch in the same place? Point him out to me, will you? Well, he happened to be in charge of melting. <laughs> it, that was the critical link. They had had a transformer failure. Their electrician, I don't know who the electrical engineer was, but uh, their electrician says, no problem, all you need to do is rewire this. Changed the whole patent. <laughs> and uh, I said, when I found this out, this was over lunch, I, they gave me a, an hour after lunch to pre prepare my presentation and then they gave me two hours to make my presentation and my suggested solutions. And now that I know about the electrical problem, I said, you've got an easy problem here except that you've got a, all this atomic waste in your system. You can't touch any of this. So this is what you're going to have to do. The PhDs were embarrassed. They, they did all the things that were recommended and they almost didn't pay me. They were closing the proje project without paying me. No, I, I hadn't planned on the project in the first place, sure. but that wasn't fair. They had been working on this project for three years. Three years. And here I solved it in one day. And over I, lunch. O, o, over lunch. <laughs> Good observation. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite amazing to me. Uh, in fact, I was surprised that John Bruns did, because John Bruns, God bless his soul, he was, he was an exceptional engineer. He had an exceptional staff. And I was lucky to be part of him, but I was not a PhD. I was one of the few non-PhDs. But it sounds like you were good at listening. Well, and you need to be able, to, more than listening, you need to be good at asking questions. Okay. <laughs> That's You're very fair. good at ask, asking questions. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, uh, those are the things that I uh, have, have a lot of fun with. Uh, yeah, I traveled around a lot of different uh, uh, companies at one point in our career, uh, the company's career, television was a major income source. And we had made small TVs, bigger TVs, and we got to the point where we couldn't make them any bigger. Well, the Japanese were making bigger ones. And we said, if they can do it, we should be able to do it. Why can't we do it? So they, uh, they asked me, 
it, how, how do you process, uh, how do you prove this can be done differently to make these bigger? Actually, it was the panels that was a big problem to have because of the visual quality. And uh, I said, well, I think you allow, give me the time and the money to build an oil model to study this. And what it boiled down to was the fact that existing gob forming machinery didn't work adequately. It needed to be digitized. Oh, really? And and for the it would it was digitized instead of having mechanical cams because the cam was trying to the uh, follower was trying to follow the cam, and no matter what you did with the cam, it would float when it when it wanted to float. It couldn't respond fast enough. And digitize, you can make the form, you can do that thing any way you want. And uh, all we had to do was to redesign the, the, the CAM system. Instead of having a mechanical system, have a digitized system. Uh, and, and that was an accident too. There were a couple of my friends up, up in Sullivan Park that on their lunch hour, they were both programmers and they played chess. So I, I asked them one day, I said, uh, I have this problem. How would you suggest that we resolve this problem? And so they, they said, well, uh, we'll work on it at, instead of our chess on, on our lunch hours. So the company got this work for, done for free. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a matter of having internal teamwork. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And that ability to communicate with lots of people. Yeah, that's yeah. really and, and, key. And, and to appreciate what other people do and, and what they're capable of doing. Not just what they do. It's how do I challenge your life? And uh, the, only, the only thing I could do was to write a memo putting their name in the memo. There was no money involved with them. They didn't care. Solving a puzzle. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was like playing chess for them. And they did it together, collaborated, and uh, uh, anyway, it, it, the world is made of a lot of really great people. Just get them together. <laughs> Who are some of your favorite colleagues? Oh, Paul Spermuli probably was one of my favorites. Paul was a mathematician beyond mathematicians, but he made other engineers' heads ache. Whenever he would work, uh, describe something, he would take it from its very basic elements and he would prove every step. <laughs> so, li uh, literally one day we had a one hour presentation and, and uh, uh, Paul was making a presentation out in Sullivan Park and people came out and they, they literally were holding their head. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was a lot of fun. But there are uh, quite a number of others, but I don't. Paul's gone now, so I can talk about him. <laughs> I'd rather not talk about people that are, might still be, might possibly listen to this. That's fine. Um, any favorite projects? You've talked about a few. Uh, One of the things that I found interesting was that we had a lot of teams putting together the Corel process. And, it, uh, and one of the part of the team was a guy that wrote the uh, maintenance engi uh, engineering manual. Okay. He wrote it for engineers. Engineers don't do the work. It's the average guy. And so you've got to write for the average guy. <coughs> By the time we had pulled our staff out of the pressware, it took two weeks for the process to break down. Uh, and so the boss asked me if I could go down and, and kind of take a look at what, the, what might be wrong and, and uh, get back to him. Well, for a six month assignment, it ended up being for a two year apart assignment. Uh, at the end of that time, it was one of my anniversary years. 
1985. And I, my wife and I took a, it was the year that I had, I guess you don't still have them anymore within the company. But they had an anniversary year, you got an extra week of paid vacation. And uh, so I had five weeks. And we had relatives in California. My sister lived out there. So we uh, packed up camper and, and my remaining child. And uh, we took a trip out to California doing sightseeing on the way and on the way back. And didn't have cell phones or anything. I couldn't get in touch with me. <laughs> so I got back to my office and my uh, boss, uh, I got to my office and there's all my stuff is boxed up. And I, I've been warned by some of my buddies that uh, they may give you this vacation, but they don't really mean it. You're likely to get fired while, they're, while you're gone. So I thought, well, maybe this box stuff stuff is my, I'm fired. It was not fired. I went to the boss and I said, how come my stuff is boxed up? They said, well, we didn't know where you wanted your office. You just got promoted. Nice. <laughs> but uh, that, so I, I went from my two-year assignment in, in Pressware to uh, being in charge of the laboratory in uh, the Decker Engineering Building as well as the oil model in Silver Park. Uh, it was, uh, but the downtown one, it had some problems, and they were in the red, a substantial amount. And the boss explained to me, he says, fix it, or you're going to be looking for a job too. And at the end of the year, six months, less than six months actually, we were back in the black. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, that was very nice. So how did you lead a group in a project like that? Uh, the first thing you do is you find out, uh, uh, well, I had been, back up, I had been called in to consult with a guy that had had problems with, a, with his, uh, with making money. Get, getting the job done and getting a job, job done economically. And uh, so I knew some of the problems because I was continually having to suggest changes. And if you can't be there to guide all of the steps, things are still going wrong. Sure. And plus there was a guy that I had hired when I would previously been in a position to do so, that he had, he was so sharp with uh, uh, mathematics, give him a calculus problem, just tipped his head back and wrote the answer down. <laughs> uh, but uh, he had a, a medical problem, that if you combined the medicine with alcohol, essentially, you've seen the ads about frying your brain? He had done that. He couldn't even uh, add up a column of figures with a calculator. He's a big guy, almost seven foot tall. Wow. He was a little intimidating. And so uh, uh, the gentleman and I, we had a talk, and it was unfortunate. Uh, supervisors have to understand that it's not just between the start time and the end time for a job that you have, that you're responsible for. You're responsible for a guy's life to give him some guidance or see that he gets some guidance. So his life is uh, more productive and, and has a little more longevity to it. Because this guy was, I think he was dead within two years. A young, relatively young man. But uh, that's, you just have to, ask questions, and, and when you don't, and you review them with people you trust. You don't try to be self-contained. Just like 
this operation, it's you and the people operating the equipment. Absolutely essential. <laughs> but that's, uh, I, I think that's pretty much, uh, there's obviously some other things, but uh, uh, those are the primary things that uh, I thought were worth sharing. Okay, let me quickly see. You did leave it in Corning during the 1972 flood. Yes. How did you bring all those furnaces back up, you and your team? Uh, we were furnace development. We were not operations. Aha. Uh -huh. We were not operations. Uh, because we had already developed the process, documented the process. In my case, where I had been in Pressware, I had written out all the stuff so that the average person could follow step by step by step by step and get it done right back to the way it was. That's great. As long as you do, do a good job there, why that's, that's the important thing. And just overall, tell me what was rewarding about your job. Uh, constant challenge and the caliber of people I had to work with. Nice. Obviously, I like people, <laughs> but I also like challenges. And uh, uh, and the fact that life in general can be better, not only for me, and my uncles taught me, but for others. Is there anything else? I haven't asked you about or that you'd like to talk about? Uh, not relative to, related to, to Corning so much, other than the fact that Corning, uh, Amo Houghton did a superb job of leadership after the flood so that people like me, because I had only lived one block away from the river, all the downstairs windows were broken, water went through the house, part of the foundation was caved in, uh, the cellar was full, literally full of mud. Those, that, uh, those groups of people, the students and so on that were hired the came yes, in right. and literally dug out my cellar and took all the furnace away and the, the hot water heater away and all the other things that were down in the cellar that didn't need to be and get me back operational. Uh, and local churches, uh, well, not local here, but uh, from around this area that sent people in, there was one, one family that came in because I had four kids uh, that I needed to recover from. Uh, I was gonna try to salvage anything I could. And there was one guy from Rochester that came in and he gave a went tour of the house. I didn't happen to be there at the time. And I uh, left a note. Any place where I left a hammer through the wall, those walls come down. Wow. So the kids, they had all great fun tearing down walls. <laughs> but uh, it allowed me to get back. Uh, the house closed up and livable by the end of the year. And any of these people that have been flooded toward the end of the year, where they don't have much time to recover, boy, do I feel for them. I, I know what they're going through. Because uh, after the flood, uh, some of the families within the valley here uh, took care of my, uh, my kids for me. Nice. While I lived in the house, protect what little bit was still there. I had a big French knife that uh, when people with flashlights, all you need to do is fly, swing that thing around so that it flashed. They didn't, they didn't come any further than the front door. So Corning's been a good community. It has, yes. Very good. Now I have lots, lots of good friends here and lots of reasons to feel good here. And a lot to do. It would not be the same without Corning Incorporated. 
Tell me more about that. Well, uh, Corning Incorporated looks ahead, and if not unselfishly, same, my same attitude, what's in it for me so that you can get benefit too? Uh, they, they want to support the educational system so that people that, who might be inclined to come to the, comp uh, to the area will benefit. Uh, the park is now being developed down where that plant had to be torn down. That's the perfect example. The, the place where the park is uh, closer to where main plant used to be uh, that has a nice uh, play area for kids uh, with all the water spouting all over the place. That, uh, that's another good example and it, it shows up from right from the main road. That's true. So uh, rather than having eyesores, uh, right now our hospital will not take, uh, uh, can't, can't move in new equipment. Several years ago, I almost died. I went to uh, well, a major hospital and because I was having problems, they couldn't find out what the problems were. They sent me home. I had a temperature of 106, went to the Corning Hospital. They found the problem and fixed it or I wouldn't be here today. That's incredible, wow. And they did this with equipment that was three generations older than the equipment that uh, other company, or other hospital. So not only do you have to have good equipment, you have to have good people. And Corning is very careful about his people. And knowing what my daughter Donna has had, had to go through with uh, her green belt recently and a whole bunch of stuff, uh, uh, they're being even more cautious today and more supportive of uh, development than they were even when I was working. We didn't have the technology. That's true. I remember my first computer, 1977. I was having to go in nights to read experiments and because we didn't have computers to, to do that. So I found out to get this computer, it had a whole 32 units of uh, memory. 32 that was a Commodore. I forget what the name <laughs> was. Anyway, uh, put it in, and all it did was read temperatures. It saved me having to go in and check on experiments. My wife was very happy. I bet. <laughs> my new wife. And my kids were too. Got to see you. Yep. Anyway, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things will continue to change. And a lot of things have gotten better. And they will get even better. That's a wonderful attitude. And I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, Beth. And uh, thank you again for coming in and doing this oral history with us.